Should public transport be free? Luxembourg becomes the first country to abolish fares for everyone. Is that the solution to traffic jams and pollution? Or will the cost of a ticket be paid in other ways? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Nick Clark. In many cities, public transport is often the easiest and cheapest way to get around. It's more environmentally friendly because fewer petrol and diesel cars are on the road. It's also free if you visit Luxembourg. It's the first country in the world to make public transport zero cost for everybody. But not everyone is on board, as Alexi O'Brien now reports. These ticket machines in Luxembourg have become obsolete. Everyone now gets a free ride on buses, trams and trains in the richest and one of the smallest countries in the European Union. Many cities have taken the same route, but Luxembourg's government says it's the first time an entire country has abolished fares for everyone. Leaders hope their initiative eases congestion, reduces pollution and supports people on low incomes. A transport pass used to cost nearly $500 a year. All over the world, we must make the same observation. Mobility as it is organized today is a failure. There are traffic jams everywhere. Urban spaces no longer work. People in rural areas have been neglected. So we really have to change the system. Like many other cities, traffic jams are common. With a population of 620,000, Luxembourg has the highest number of cars per person in Europe. Congestion's made worse by the 200,000 commuters who drive from neighbouring Belgium, France and Germany to work in Luxembourg. Some say they'll now change their habits. It is more environmentally friendly to take public transport, in my case, because the, um, the bus is um, electric, at least for a certain part of the city. Um, so that is definitely an incentive not to like, drive the car every day. Uh, I think Luxembourg is setting an example for Europe and the rest of the world by making public transport free for everyone. In terms of the money that I'd be saving just by taking public transport, it makes a lot of sense to just yeah, start taking the bus every single day. Tomorrow's mobility is already here. Let's help Luxembourg move on. Scrapping fares is part of a 15-year government plan to upgrade buses and trains, build bike lanes and encourage more carpooling. But critics say the government has failed to invest on transport and complain about poor roads and a run-down rail system. The government admits it'll lose around $40 million a year in ticket sales, but hopes that won't derail its vision for the future. Alexi O'Brien for Inside Story. All right, let's uh, look at where else bus and tram tickets are free. Tallinn in Estonia became the first fare-free European capital. That was back in 2013. But only if you live there, no good for tourists. Uh, Dunkirk in northern France introduced free travel two years ago. Bus passenger totals have soared since then. And last year, India's capital, New Delhi, announced free bus and metro fares for women. Uh, the safety initiative follows murders and rape attacks on public transport. And if you live in Kansas City in the United States, free bus services are planned this year. The $9 million annual cost is the same as collected in bus ticket revenue now. All right, let's uh, bring in our guests. Here in the studio with me is uh, Gabriel Lee, who's transport correspondent for the global affairs and lifestyle magazine Monocle. Uh, in Luxembourg, Constance Carr is standing by, senior research scientist at the University of Luxembourg. She's also an urban geographer. And in Chandigarh in India, Sahrika Pandabat is a founder trustee of the Ragiri Foundation, which promotes road safety, sustainable transport and community development. Great to see you all. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Constance in Luxembourg, Constance Carr, it'd be great to start with you. On the face of it, this plan sounds great, doesn't it? But does it bear close scrutiny? What do you think? Yes, I think it does. I think, um, yeah, one has to look at the specific situation of Luxembourg. It's a, it's a small country. It's very much dependent on cross-border labor. And the infrastructure needs to catch up to its current, current economic system, So it's, which is quite lagging at the moment. And um, that needs to be worked on before 
the price, if you ask right. me. But is it going to work? Because public transport is already incredibly cheap in Luxembourg, and Luxembourg is pretty rich, isn't it? And you've got a lot of people who drive across the border from outside the country to work in the Luxembourg city. Yeah, well, this is one of the issues. I mean, the, the driving is partly because the cross-border public transit options are so weak and unreliable and uncomfortable. Um, and this, at least, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. So the more the, the more growth pressure there is in, in Luxembourg City, the more infrastructure is going to be required. And we also have to think about the housing prices as well. For many, for most labor, it's more financial makes more financial sense to live in the border regions and look for mobility options from there, whether they're, you know, whether they're one or two cars or whether they're, you know, the infrastructure in public mobility, which is rather, which is rather insufficient. Right. Do you think there will be an uptake, though, in, in passenger numbers? Because uh, petrol and diesel is also cheap in Luxembourg, isn't it? And in fact, you have tourists coming in, petrol tourists, as it were, to fill up their cars, fill up their tanks. That's right. That's right. That exists also. Um, well, I can't. Of course, one can't predict yet what's going to happen in Luxembourg, and there are studies being done on this. But also, we have to realize that there's. We don't have to reinvent the wheel here. In the transport geography sector, there's lots of research on this, and they show repeatedly that a change in fare doesn't change much in habits. Actually, that to get people out of their cars, the public transport op option needs to be. Um, comfortable, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be safe. And also, we need to start thinking about ways to um, make choosing the car a little less palatable than it currently is. Right, OK. Well, so Gabrielle Lee, let's, let's, let's bring in uh, Gabrielle in, in the studio here. You research transport systems right around the world. Uh, what do you think? Uh, we hear there from Constance that the change in fare does not necessarily encourage a change in practice. What's your thought? Right, I think that's, that's true. I mean, I, I think... You know, if you make public transport free, it can be a part of an overall solution. But you need many more aspects in that solution in order to incentivize people to take public transport instead of getting in their car. Uh, and that includes some of the things uh, that Constance mentioned, uh, having it be reliable, safe, uh, punctual. Um, you know, also, you need to have a, a, a broader system that, that takes into account that, you know, people, people feel more comfortable in their cars in many cases. In many cases, even with a good public transport system, like in Stockholm, where I'm based, uh, you have a very good system, but it takes maybe twice the amount of time uh, to get somewhere uh, as, as it would in your car. So, you know, uh, you have to also uh, penalize people who are in their cars. You need to raise, if you don't have a congestion charge, you need to have one, and you need to maybe in some cases even raise it. Uh, mm. So there, there's, there's lots of ways to do this. I think... In general, I, in principle, I like the idea of, of free public transport. Uh, you've seen examples where it's been successful, but especially in larger cities, uh, you need to really rethink the whole fabric of, of urban mobility, which many cities haven't done. The thing is, we, we call it free, but there's no such thing as a free lunch, is there? That's right, yeah. I mean, in many cases, uh, you would have to say, for example, have a higher tax uh, to pay for this, a municipal tax maybe, to pay for your free public transport, uh, which, you know, in every city, that's going to be a different situation. You could maybe make the case for that. There are also potential cost savings if you, if you reduce the need for uh, controlling fares. Right now, they have hundreds of police officers in New York City uh, going after people who are evading fares. Now, how much does it cost to, to, to have those police, right. there, for example? Uh, you can speed up transit times because people don't have to pay when they get onto the bus. There, there are other tangential benefits, too, to consider. And, and the, some of those include saving, saving money, actually. Right. Uh, we're going to move on to India in just a second. But, but just one final question to you, Gabriel. Wouldn't a tax on fuel for cars be a better idea? Because then it negates that the loss of an income stream from making uh, public transport free and you're gaining revenue from doing that and making it more expensive for people to use their cars. Yeah, I think it could be, you know, depending on the situation again. Or you could do it in combination, you know, make it more expensive mm. to use the car and lower fares for certain people or, or, or reduce fares to zero across the board and use the revenues from the, from the cars uh, to, mm. to offset. Right. OK, let's uh, bring in Sarika in Delhi. Uh, Sarika, there's other aspects to this, of course, not just uh, because of congestion or because of environmental concerns. Delhi brought in this uh, zero-fee system for women to improve their safety. Explain that for us, if you would, and, and does it work? Yes, it definitely work, uh, because if you see the average trip rate of uh, any city in India, including Delhi, is just 1 or 1.2. Example, only one trip a person do in a day. If you compare to any other city uh, across world, it is 2.4 or 3. 
So we are really very, very low in already uh, the per capita uh, travel rate. So uh, if we see that, why it is happening? Because only for 15 percent a workforce, uh, in a woman workforce in our country, uh, actually we, uh, uh, goes for work or go, going for any other commuting. Uh, that create the trip, plan, uh, you know, travel uh, trip travel rate. But if you see uh, in Delhi, it is less than the uh, national uh, national percentage. So it's just twelve. That is only 12% of the women traveling for their work. So it is very, very important, uh, uh, actually, if you are making or uh, subsidizing or making free public transport system for women. So we have seen uh, this thing has been launched in September. And in one month time, we have seen that the, uh, uh, the women participation or the women traveling in the public transport has been increased to 50%. Okay, so, but then you have the. Sorry to jump in there. I just, I just, just want to jump in because I, I read that the former managing director of Delhi Metro wrote to the prime minister before this happened, asking him not to approve the idea because he felt that it would set an alarming precedent uh, for other metro projects around the country. So there's not universal support, is there? So you know, as a government, one thing that you can subsidize or make it free is mobility. Why we make roads free for everyone? It's not providing, you know, the cars being one time tax. It is not that. So, like, you know, this is one thing a government should do. To, because if you are providing affordable, uh, you know, uh, safe and uh, safe mobility, then you adding to women workforce. And that is adding to your GDP, right? So that is one thing as a, uh, what you can use uh, as your tax money is giving affordable or free mobility to everyone, okay. not just women, but for everyone. Okay. Uh, Constance, this question of cost, in Luxembourg, ticket revenue amounts to uh, 41 million euros from public transport, and that deficit apparently, <clears throat> excuse me, will now be met by the Treasury. But as we were discussing with Gabriel, someone somewhere is stumping up the cost. So how has that been dealt with in, in Luxembourg? Well, it will be put on the taxpayer, of course. Um, and one can, of course, talk about how taxes are, as, are a means of redistributing wealth. This is, of course, a very important mechanism. In the case of Luxembourg, we got to remember, too, that, again, it's a cross-border situation, and a lot of um, labor is living in the border regions, and they're paying tax as well. And it's the question of how much th will they be paying taxes in addition to paying the, for the mobilities to even get to the border before they get to the free transport option inside of the country. So there's a, it's not necessary, it's not a magic bullet, let's say. Right. And Gabriel, so we, we talked about how this has also been rolled out in, in Dunkirk and in Tallinn and Estonia. Uh, passenger totals have soared in Dunkirk, and I think it's been successful in, in Tallinn too, hasn't it? Yeah. Tell us about that. But conversely, what the impact on the numbers of cars on the roads has been. Right. I think you see that in general, if you, if you make public transport free, then ridership goes up. That seems to be a pretty constant, especially in these smaller cities that have tried it. It tends to work well in terms of, yeah, raising the number of people using it, but it doesn't necessarily take cars off the road. Uh, in, in Tallinn, as I understand, it has, by some degree, not a huge amount, something like 10%. Uh, but... Look, if, if the goal is to, if to take cars out of the city center or, or your, your, whatever the urban core might be, uh, then you need other policies. Like I mentioned, it's not going to be enough to just make free public transport. Right. It's all about horses for courses, isn't it? Because one city is very different from the next. I mean, what, what you can do in Tallinn or in Dunkirk or indeed in, in Luxembourg, uh, you can't certainly do in New York or in London. Right. Yeah. These larger cities, obviously, it's a, a much uh, a bigger challenge. You also have the fact that with smaller uh, public transport systems made for smaller cities, uh, you know, the cost of collecting fares and enforcing fares can be uh, much higher relative to what you lose. So, in other words, uh, the math might make more sense for them in terms of revenue loss versus cost efficiencies gained. Whereas in New York, that's a much more complicated uh, situation. Billions of dollars a year in ticket revenue goes towards uh, the MTA. So. Yeah, it's, it's very complex, especially in larger cities, very difficult, clearly, because otherwise we would see more of them doing it. You know? Right. Uh, but conversely, we have Kansas, where they're offering a free bus service to residents by 20, for 2020 to, to build up a kind of culture of bus riding, because, of course, in the 50s, the, the transport infrastructure, public transport infrastructure, was just ripped out to make way for the car. 
Yes, and that's true. I mean, especially in places like uh, in the U.S. where you have, uh, yeah, people have been pushed toward the car for years and now we're trying to get them back into public transport. You need that cultural shift to happen. You need ridership to go up. Obviously, with low ridership, there's lower investment. The bus is worse and worse as less people ride it and vice versa, right? So you need, uh, you need to get more people riding. And, and I think that's great if you, if you begin trialing certain services, certain bus lines, uh, making them free, getting people on and, and showing that it works, that people will take it and that you know you can put on more services and therefore increase the ridership. Right, uh, horses for courses, Sirika. When we're talking about India, uh, it's a, a different ball game again, isn't it? When you're dealing with a, a country with a population of more than a billion and, and cities with millions and millions of people uh, and not a great deal of wealth around in many parts of them, uh, how do you take on tackling the transport infrastructure of the future in India? So. If you see the whole demography, the um, uh, basically the whole workforce who basically move in the public transport system, uh, it's mostly the poor, uh, which actually who actually don't able to afford any other mobility. In fact, the share mobility also. So if you see this, then we really need to look into uh, how to enhance more and more public transport system in all of our cities, including Delhi. Because as you as you highlighted, that we have very different traffic, even we are fighting uh, as the most polluted city in the world. So if you see that, it's, uh, you know, that also somehow we need to focus on. Uh, and the only solution is definitely public transport system and improving walking and cycling infrastructure in the city, which other cities have been done it very nicely. Many other, many say Latin American cities have made it successful. Many European cities have made it successful. So why not India? Because right. we always give an excuse that India is different. And it is not. Because if you see, people really want to move out. People looking for jobs, opportunities. And the only solution for that is providing affordable, safe, and reliable public transport. Mm. Uh, Constance, things have got to change in a big way as we, we move into the latter half of this century and we're talking uh, ideally about a zero-carbon world. What might transport solutions look like as we enter that uh, brave new era? Well, I would certainly be, um, I would certainly um, endorse, you know, more investment into public infrastructure, absolutely. Um, but I want to draw back on it. We have to show that it, that it works. And there is a kind of a metaphor circulating around Luxembourg right now that this is a the public free public transit is the cherry on the cake, but the converse to that is that well the cake needs to be baked first, and so we right now the public transport options here are very weak and yeah this needs to be worked on so more investments of course. Yeah, and Gabriel, you looked at, we were talking a bit earlier before the program started, and uh, you looked at Helsinki, didn't you, which is challenging the kind of widely accepted views of how mobility should be and kind of organising the priorities. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, they're finding ways to, you know, not only work with private companies and in, in, in the public infrastructure, but also to sort of build, uh, you know, rebuild and build new parts of the city to in order to... Uh, again, disincentivize uh, cars. They're putting no parking on the street, for example. So if someone wants to build a parking garage in their building, they can, but their, their take is that, well, it'll probably be you know, valuable enough real estate that they won't do that. And so people, especially if you have good public transport, they, they're, they're making that really, really important. Uh, you know, and, and they're also trying to get people to, to walk and cycle. That's, that's another really, actually relatively low cost way to get people away from cars and to, to have people living a, a more, you know, healthy life in the public uh, realm, right? Uh, so you put in cycle lanes that, that can take you where you need to go. You, you show people that it, it's safe to do that. Uh, you know, that, that's, that can be another way to go about this. And, and they're kind of pioneering that. Right, and that, that's how the focus is. So it's going from walking as the priority, then biking, then public transport, then, then cargo, uh, shifting cargo around. And right. Uh, right at the bottom of the list is cars. Right, I mean, naturally, there will be, you know, the need to deliver goods. There will be some cars around, uh, you know, as we head into the future of, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, small, smaller electric vehicles. You have new possibilities for how you know you could you could have cars in the urban core, but they are all shared. They're not privately owned, for example. So they're always in use. They're not parked on the street, or they're not you know sitting around most of the time. So there's lots of ways, as we especially as we get new technology to to address this. Right, and Sarika in Chandigarh, it's, it's all part of a, the the need to have a new mindset, if you like, and a way is uh, the way we look at public transport. 
This is basically public transport means for the poor because the affordability of buying a car has been increased drastically in India. But still, you know, 50% of our people uh, either walk or use public transport system in any of the Indian cities. And if you see, 70% of our money on transportation is focused on building more and more roads for the farms. So this is somehow we are basically contradicting our own vision, our own uh, uh, strategies to making uh, pollution-free city or fighting for pollution or uh, increasing more share. This is very contradictory when we're looking into the investment part in the uh, transportation system. More. So where, uh, as I actually said uh, in my previous speaker that, you know, if we want to improve public transport system, we need to focus on more and more walking infrastructure, which is last mile connectivity, to reach to a public transport system. Then we need to make our public transport system really safe and reliable. Like in reliable in the sense that, okay, I can uh, get my public transport system in the given point of time. So that is very, very important thing. And See, this is the future. We just can't keep on constructing more and more roads for cars. And that way, we are going to actually deteriorating uh, the air quality more and more. And that's why our whole budgetary system needs to improve. Okay. Where we need to focus on charging more to the car owners, like condition pricing, parking policies, or in, in increasing the road tax. And okay, so we can, I'm going to just jump in there because we're coming, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah, we're just coming towards the end of the program. We're just coming to the end of the program. And Gabriel, I just want to just uh, get your take on this. If you were designing a city now, a new city, how would you, how would it look in the shape of its public transport system? And, and, and if you had the, that kind of blank canvas to develop what you wanted? Well, I think what we were talking about before, I mean, it, you know, a lot of cities, they have to work with what they have, right? And so that, that can be difficult to put the kind of ideal uh, uh, transport mobility, let's say, system in place. But, uh, but I, think, I think something like, you know, what Helsinki is trying to do is, is a great approach. I think, you know, you, you prioritize uh, getting people out into the street and having them on ground level, you know, cycling or walking, right? And where that's not possible, you have, uh, uh, you know, good electric options for, you know, uh, mobility around the urban core. And then you have, you know, th the trick would be, it, I think very important is to have these kind of easy intermodal connections. You have, you know, you can get onto the next thing, the, the long distance train or even the plane, uh, you know, seamlessly where you don't have to, those are the pain points, I think, where you're kind of pushed toward a car, where you don't want to have to do the kind of awkward connection from one thing to another. Uh, so, you know, I think I would start with that. Yeah. And Constance, what about you? What's your sense of the, the amount of uh, research and investment that's going into the transport systems of the future in, in our global cities? Um, I would say that it's there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I also want to stress, too, every city really is different. Mm. And they, the, any transport um, infrastructure project needs to respond to the local problems and the local really specific issues. So, yes. And there's, a lot, of course, a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. And the point is that uh, before we talk about kind of autonomous cars and free rides, in many ways, people would say, wouldn't it just be great if the trains ran on time? Right. Yeah, that's key. Having it work well, punctual, reliable, frequent service, I think, and, and easy connections. Yeah. And as yeah. far as Stockholm is concerned, just very briefly, if you would, do you think you see that as a kind of leader in Europe? Uh, I think it could be more of a leader. Uh, you know, it, it has a good system. I think that it's great that in, in Stockholm and in Sweden in general, you can get anywhere you need to go without a private car, basically. And that's something you can't say for many places, for example, my home country of the US. Uh, but I think they could, they could do more. I think they could uh, invest more. I see, I see cities like Copenhagen with its incredible adoption of, of cycling or Helsinki with its sort of attempt to create new solutions. I see them doing more, at least if we talk about that region. All right. Well, great. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion talking about uh, a little glimpse into the future. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, Gabriel Lee, uh, Constance Carr and Sarika Pandabat. Thanks very much indeed. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now.